We're very lucky today to have two honored guests visit with us. We're in the office of Dr. Lee Berger, and next to him is Dr. John Hawks. They are the principal investigators of the Rising Star Project, and Dr. Berger visited with us back in November, and at that time there were lots of great questions that were asked, and no answers were allowed to be given because things had not been published. But we're now at the point where things are being published and we can actually have a conversation that doesn't rely on, you'll have to wait. <laughs> and so, and, and St. Mark students have been incredibly patient in this, so I don't want to waste any more time because we now have a chance to get answers from the two folks whose lives are going to change pretty significantly here, I believe. And so, the first question that everyone asks is, what did you have in the Rising Star Cave? And I think it turns out to be a little bit different than a lot of us expected. Well, I, I think it was a little bit different than any of us could have expected when we first started removing material from there um, way back almost two years ago. What we've discovered uh, in the Rising Star system in a chamber that we're now calling the Dinaletti Chamber, and that means Chamber of Stars, and that's in honor, of course, the, of the Rising Star site is that we've discovered a new species of early hominid, or at least primitive hominid. And what that species is, is a new species in our own genus, the genus Homo, that we have named Homo naledi. Uh, and naledi means star in the Sutu language. So it is a, it's a very exciting time for us because it's a creature that I think it's fair to say no one expected we would ever discover. A creature that looks very different than uh, perhaps any other uh, member of the genus Homo uh, in many, many surprising ways. And I guess that begs the big question, what are these unique ways? Well, I'll, I'll start and maybe pass over to John a little bit, but if you took a broad brushstroke of this creature, it has a very tiny brain. Uh, many people who looked at the images before we published said, oh, it must be a Homo erectus or something like that. And yes, the skull shape does look like that. But what is remarkable is that the brain size is very, very tiny. Half, if not more than half, of what an average Homo erectus brain probably is. The females have brains as small as an Australopithecine, uh, around 450 cubic centimeters. And that's about the size of my fist. The males are a little bit larger than that, averaging around 550 cubic centimeters. So it's a tiny head. Surprisingly, on a relatively tall body. Uh, these, uh, uh, the species appears to be about five feet tall, uh, which is remarkably tall given that very small head. They have relatively small dentition, uh, similar in size to large dentition of modern humans, but not shaped like those of modern humans. In fact, shaped more generally like more primitive members. In fact, with shape similar to Australopithecines, at least in the back part of the teeth. Uh, the rest of the body is a bizarre mosaic. Uh, the shoulders are probably best compared to an ape or a gibbon, and that is pretty exceptional. It indicates to us probably some climbing underway. The arms, uh, we don't have an exact length on, but they appear to be proportioned more like humans. The hands are strange. They're proportioned like humans with an unusually long thumb and a great deal of curvature. Uh, the pelvis looks to be more primitive, in fact, even primitive to things like sediba, like nostrilopithecine. Certainly the proximal femurs are. The rest of the legs are long and very, very similar to those of a human. I think that combination, it's fair to say, was unexpected. You just, the thing that I want people to know is that when, pe when, when we were excavating this, the pieces are coming out of the ground, right? And we're looking at it piece by piece. And every piece is telling this different story. And literally, within having the first ten pieces of this, we didn't know if we had multiple kinds of things. We didn't know because they were, each of them, we had one of those thumbs, you know, one of those metacarpals in the thumb. And we're like, we've never seen anything like this before. And we had a jaw. And we're like, well, that sort of looks like a sediba or early homo type of jaw. We had pieces of cranium. And we're like, this is such a small head. You know, you start... And we had a proximal femur. This is Australopithecine looking thing. And as the picture filled in, it became clear that 
we're looking at something that has a totally unexpected mixture of characteristics. And for us, that was hard to explain. That we'd clearly never seen before in the entire hominid record. And here's an important point. Usually, we're dealing with one or two specimens. We have more than 15 individuals, and almost every single bone in the body replicated multiple times, and they're all the same. So there's no pathology here, there's no chance that we're just looking at not individual. What we're looking at is a pattern within a population of one species that it's fair to say probably no one expected would pop out of a South African cave. So I know I've been here now for almost two weeks, and I've had a chance to, to see the, the fossils, to, to talk with people, and I think you're absolutely right that certainly it wasn't expected. And when my students last year did their hypotheses, no one thought this. You know, this is you never have guessed. <laughs> well, yeah. that's comforting. This, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> because if they guessed this, I would have <laughs> given them a job. <laughs> <laughs> we would have had to give yes, them a job. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but the hints were there, but especially in the body, how incredibly different it's been. And so here you have something that, would you say, because the feet and the lower limbs were so human, would they have walked like us, perhaps? That's a great question, and the answer is I don't think we're ready to know that yet. That's going to take quite a lot of things like data analysis and very complex science to do in three dimensions. Uh, that, that the lower limb, at least from sort of midway down the thigh to the, to the feet, is so human-like that there are clearly close similarities with the way in which this humans walk, and this would have walked. But the pelvis is different. Pelvis is primitive. Um, which is exactly the opposite of what Sediba had, a more advanced pelvis. So, so the answer is, I don't know, because we've never seen anything like this. Those studies are underway, um, but that three-dimensional movement requires the entirety of the body. And so we need to build these things in very complex models, and I don't think we're ready to answer that. So the answer is, though, there must be some similarity. This is clearly, in part, the leg of a long-distance walker, but we don't know exactly how this whole thing functions. So, I, I, would, yeah. I would add that, you know, people will say, well, if it's so weird, you know, why did you feel like you were comfortable calling it homo, like, like we are? And it's features like that that we said, well, this is actually very similar to us. And it looks like the way that they used their hands might have been very similar to us. And their teeth are not like earlier hominids. Their teeth are much more similar to, to what we think of as homo. And so we look at those systems and we say, you know, there is some sense to this, but it is different than what we thought we would find. We thought we would find maybe one of those things was preceding the others, or, or maybe they would make some sense in terms of how they originated in our, in our lineage. What we find here is a package of things that go together that collectively look to us like, well, this is human-like in those, in those ways, but that leaves us explaining the rest of the skeleton, which is not human-like. And so that requires, of course, a great deal more science to be done. But this, this project is clearly not over yet. Which is, <laughs> yeah. This project is just beginning. And those of us who have followed it in some detail know that when you left the fossil chamber, which is referred to now as 101. And the Dinaletti chamber. Right, and the Dinaletti chamber that you, um, you left a lot of stuff down there. Can you, for our audience, give them a sense of how much you think might be down there? Well, that's kind of hard to say because it's underground and we haven't excavated yet. But given the way the recovery went, that material scattered across the whole of the chamber floor, and that when we put one small test bit in that is less than a yard and less than sort of eight inches deep, that we recovered over 1,300 remains individually from that little pit. If that density continues, there are tens of thousands of remains in that chamber. And this is going to lead to the next big question that people have been asking since the very beginning. We had the great adventure of the six underground astronauts and the cave support team 
going down to get into this incredibly difficult space. And yet, you have you know, at least 15 individuals, I believe, yes. represented, possibly more as time goes on. Everyone's dying to know, how could primitive creatures like this have gotten down into a cave that took modern humans, flashlights, climbing gear and the like? It seems kind of amazing. Well, when it was amazing to us as well, uh, obviously during the course of the recovery, um, something the world didn't realize was happening was happening in front of us uh, that we didn't reveal to the world. And that was that besides a couple of remains of an owl that were lying on the surface that had clearly come in at some later point, that there was nothing in this chamber but... Homo Nalevi specimens. Only hominids were in the chamber. Um, we didn't reveal that to the world uh, because, firstly, nothing like that has ever occurred really in the history of this size. It was completely unexpected. Uh, that sort of signal, in fact, is practically unknown outside of modern human burials. And that led us to a great deal of caution. Because we knew by then that the brain was very small. We knew that this wasn't a human. We knew it was clearly anything but a human. It wasn't even... A human is about the last thing you would compare this to. You would much rather compare it to an Australopithecine or something like that. Very, very primitive. And up until that moment, we were pretty sure that the sort of ritualized body disposal that sometimes we call in modern humans burial is unique to modern humans. In fact, it practically defines creatures with large brains like us and with physical features like us from head to toe. It's almost the definition of what it means to be human. We attempted over the period of a year and a half to find any other possibility of why these specimens are in there. And what were some of the other possibilities you looked seriously at? Well, we obviously wanted to know if this is some catastrophic event. Could they have been washed in there? Could they have fallen in there? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, there is no movement by water laterally within this that could have moved them in there. There's no collapse that could have killed them. And they all didn't come in at the same time. We could establish by looking at the bones and their positions that they came in one by one by one by one by one over time. And so we could pretty much eliminate the idea of catastrophe. And furthermore, we understood that this cave was always isolated and remote. That you would have had to travel into a cave system to get into the cave because the cave has never been open to the exterior surface directly. All the sediments in the cave derive from the surrounding rock of the cave itself. We could eliminate external openings. We could eliminate catastrophe. We could eliminate uh, a situation where uh, somehow these creatures are being eaten by something because there are no marks on them. We There's poured no over to... every one of the bones and didn't find any tooth marks, no indication that they'd been, you know, that they'd been injured. That you know, it, it seemed like you know, if you're going to find some other explanation that we know operate in other fossil sites, there's nothing like that in this site. You know, we really looked, you know, we, we scraped the bottom of the barrel looking for other explanations than this. And eventually we have reached the hypothesis that this is a ritualized disposal of the dead by a non-human animal. And we, nor any colleagues, nor the many dozens and dozens and dozens of scientists that we've consulted with around the world about this can come to another conclusion that can be tested or is reasonable other than we've been wrong that this behavior was unique to humans and no longer defines us. And I think that will, as amazing as that is, it will take a little while I think, for that to sink in for all of us.
I'm not sure it's sunk in for us yet either. <laughs> well, we don't, you know, you, you start to wonder about the significance of it. You know, the first time that Jane Goodall observed chimpanzees using tools in the wild, that really forced people to reevaluate what they thought about as humans as a tool-making creature, because clearly that didn't any longer define us. And so they then took time to alter their, their ideas, you know, well, maybe stone tools or, or maybe it's something about the way that we do things with technology, or maybe it's something else, maybe it's language. And this sort of ritualized maybe, behavior maybe is something Maybe it's that recognition they, of our own mortality. So think of it like this, you know, in the 19th century, we saw ourselves as separate from nature. We were different fundamentally from the natural world. And so we began explaining why we were that way, etc. And we were comfortable with that separation. When Jane identified that chimpanzees use tools, and we had not truly recognized that in the animal kingdom at that point, it perhaps brought us that much closer to nature. And certainly some of the fossil finds that had been made were arguing that perhaps that separation is there. But then we recognized other animals use tools too. So that made us a little more comfortable that, you know, okay, tool use isn't our definition. But we were kept with these very special behaviors that we recognize our own mortality. We're perhaps the only animal that knows it's going to die. Well, now we're not the only animal. And perhaps that distance has now been bridged. And effectively, there's very little, if anything, that now separates us. You have to go to questions like, is it art? Is it music? Is it things that perhaps we may never see? But we do now know... I think it's reasonable to say that that behavior we are not alone in. And if you take evolution, you know, as a an explanation for life's diversity, and humans are a product of it, then the things that characterize us today arose sometime in the past. But there's no reason to think that they all arose suddenly or at the same time, or that they that there should be lots of things that set our species apart. When we find evidence that earlier hominin species had things like us, or if they had their own things that are similar to us, we have to accept that this is something that was a product of evolution. And that's what we should expect, really. It's just finding the data that shows how broad those things are shared. Although I think that we shouldn't underestimate that, that many, many scientists and people are going to find this the most controversial aspect of this, because really, truly, until this moment, we would have said, in fact, that perhaps recognition of mortality, these kind of things, and all the behaviors that fall out of that, like artwork and things like that, were unique and had evolved and were a recent phenomenon that allowed us to say we're different. What this argues is you can't use that Now the next question, we have a hominid species ritually disposing of its dead over a period of time it seems. That this was not, this whole group died and was taken down there in one shot, but it, right. it seems from your work you're saying that they may have been brought in over, do you have a sense of how long that? No, uh, we really don't. Um, it is some time, but we don't have a sense. We, we can tell you from the morphology of these individuals that they're all remarkably alike. Uh, they, really, the variation in them is what you would see almost in a, a related family level. And, and so that perhaps argues to a relatively shorter period of time. But remember, we're, we're still ultimately paleoanthropologists. For us, that could be decades, hundred, a hundred years, or something like that. We just simply don't have an answer to that question. Okay, and um, the, the folks who are represented in this assemblage, can you describe them? Is it all folks who died as elderly individuals, people who may have died of some sort of trauma and brought down? Um, we, have, we have babies. We have babies that are very near the age that they're born. We have toddlers, we have young children and older children, we have young adults, we have old adults. 
And we're talking about a minimum of 15 individuals. We have an, a, a general idea of the age of each of those, and we have them represented across the lifespan. You know, so it is, it is representing, A, it's super important for us, because it's representing a spectrum of evidence about growth and development that is unique in the fossil record of hominids. We do not have anything like this for any other site. But it also, while well, I'm a subject of how did they get in there, right, it's clear that this is some sort of cultural phenomenon. Right? We don't know what that would require, but clearly they knew of this place. They knew that this was a place where the dead resided or were to be taken. Um, and they, and they, when people died, when these hominids died. <laughs> it's terrible right? when people, yes. that's right. <laughs> they're not people. When, uh, <laughs> when these hominids died, uh, they're presumably individuals that knew them were collecting them or witnessing it and bringing them to this place. I, I think what that, that slip of the tongue that John made is going to be an interesting part of this journey because we've never had to talk about a non-human species in terms of real culture. Now people say there are animal cultures and stuff, but this is this is effectively our culture that now another species is doing, but we don't know did they invent it? Is it unique to them? Did we get it from them? Did they, did they get it from us? We have none of those answers right now. We're, yeah. And so our vocabulary is, is, is going to be difficult here because humans have never had to have a dialogue or a discussion right. about another species doing something that we yeah. thought was ours. Yeah. And so how close are these individuals to us in time? They're physically quite different. They have this amazing behavior that seems to harken to a very modern sense. But so far we haven't had a chance to discuss the, the other big question, if there are three big questions, what is it, how did they get there, how old are they? And you are going to be, and so are all your students and those listening to this, very disappointed in that we don't know. And uh, we really are not very close to that answer right now for interesting reasons. Because they're all alone. We have nothing but them. And usually, well, in fact, in every single other case, mm -hmm. in all of history, from anywhere, we've had other stuff with them, other animals. It would lead us to the idea of how old they were. If, if it were cases like this, we might have had culture or whatever. They're alone. They're in a, a sediment and dirt buried within it that comes from there. Inside of that own chamber, we simply don't know. Now, some people are going to go, well, if you don't know, then how can you be talking about them as a primitive species related to us? Because we don't need an age to actually establish their relationship to us and our lineage because we have their physical features. So we can compare them to us. We can use words like they're primitive of to us. We can compare them to Sediba. We can compare them to Zinjanthropus and know the possible relationships. But we don't need to know how old they are today. It will be interesting when we do find out how old they are, whatever age they are, this is going to be traumatic to our field of science in the most wonderful way. And would you be willing to share with us what if they are very old. What if they are fairly recent? Well, I'll and, and start in those, those, those implications. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so let me start in, in uh, because I did say that it's going to be shocking, with whichever point. Um, if we use their morphology, even though we've never seen anything like this before, we, to, to place them in time, we place them probably around the middle. If, if you took, if you say that, you know, that, that hominids originate from very primitive sort of things four to five million years ago or so, and that 
the genus Homo evolves around somewhere in the gray area around two million years, and here we are in the present, then we would want to put them in that two million year-ish range based on what they look like. It would still mean we would have to change practically everything about the storyline of how we got here, and particularly when you add in the behavior. But certainly it would mean that we've got most of that story wrong in the past. Um, but that's what would happen if you put them in the middle. So that's the least interesting possibility, because on average, that's sort of where we would expect them to be based on what they Physically look like. Physically, the least Physically. interesting. Behaviorally. But what I wanted to say is that behaviorally, obviously, it's super interesting if that's true. Yes, that rocks the, the basis of all humanity there if we're talking back that far in deep time. And physically, it doesn't solve any problems for them to be that age because we still have this strange mixture of characteristics that must have come to be in the same body somehow. So we have to make we have to explain that, no matter if they're the two million years that that on the surface we would say based on their brain or based on you know their relationships it looks like to Homo erectus or Homo habilis that they might be. But also it would mean though that we would have to very carefully look at the entire way we look at the origins of archaeology, because what if they did it? And it wasn't who we thought it was doing all this archaeology, if that goes back two million years. And the very idea that, that Homo erectus is somehow a primitive behavior to modern humans and archaic Homo sapiens would be drawn into question. We'd have to look at everything. Now, if they're very old, if they're very old, what if you're very young? Old. Okay, what if old. they're four million years old? old? What if they're three million years old? Well, that would mean that probably the entire story of the Australopiths is a sideshow to what's going on. Because certainly those characters are more allied to us than they are to those things. And therefore, that we were missing something the entire time. And that many of the things that we were interpreting were simply that. They were experiments in bipedal apes. It would, it would, in some ways, if they were old, it would mean that our homo lineage was much older than we thought. But it would be, in some ways, easier for us yes. to envision that because it means that the primitive characteristics of this would be expected, and the new homo-like things are what led to homo. That's right. right. And it would mean that perhaps it would perhaps explain why we haven't seen this before. They were hiding themselves from us the entire time. <laughs> it would make many other fossils into side branches that, that weren't part of our direct ancestry. And it would also mean that we had some form of hominin ritually, culturally, taking care of its dead not long after we diverged from chimpanzees. That would be incredible. And then, of course, very young. Very young is uh, probably would be the most dramatic result. Because what that would say, and when I mean very young, let's say, you know, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 years. Doesn't sound very young to many people, <laughs> but that's young. Um, because we're around at that time. Yeah, we, and right. I mean we yeah. as a species. If they're that young, then it means that they come from deep time. That's clear. They come from somewhere back there over a million, maybe over two million years old, and they were there all along. We just missed them. It means that we could have difficulty assigning cultural archaeology that we associate with our species and its immediate predecessors, complex stone tools, hafted spears, anything like that. We would have to be cautious about an immediate assignment Oh, well, that's done by humans. Because what if it wasn't? Because these would be there with clearly mental capacities, even though their brains are small, that are only shared with us. Which means that the, you have to examine the possibility that other parts of their behavior are as complex as ours. Yeah. And is, is there some look for evidence of those other behaviors in the ongoing work? I think one thing a lot of us might suggest is 
I haven't heard you mention anything about tools. I, I, when I'm in, they're alone in there. They're alone they in there. They have no artifacts. It doesn't there. mean yeah. that we won't bump into an artifact or two, but the interesting thing is, is that if you presume that this is some random sort of assemblage the way we picked it up, it would have been likely if there are artifacts in abundance that we would have bumped into them so far. We haven't. So we have to see that as a mystery. Yeah, we have, other than where they are and how they must have accumulated, we have very little evidence of, of what their lives were like. We don't, they weren't living in the chamber where we found them. They, there's no debris that indicates that they were living there or spending time there. So imagine the problem that we face. It's like if you found a mass grave of humans that were placed there with no clothing on them, no artifacts, no nothing, and you just found them, dug them up, what would you be able to tell about them? Well, quite a lot, right? You'd, you would know probably their sexes, you could get an idea of their ages, you could get an idea, do they represent a related population, families, etc. You'd know that they were placed there all at the same time and there they are, and you'd know where they were in the world because you dug them up. But that would be about it. And so there'd be this great mystery of who are these people? What were their lives like? What brought them to this point? And that's where we are right now. Who are these creatures? These are not humans. What did they live like? How, where were they in the greater scheme of their environments? What were they thinking about as they carried their dead into this chamber, taking some theoretically considerable risk to do so? That's the exciting mystery that's out there. It's a completely unexpected encounter with another species that has complexity that we thought was special to us. That is an amazing storyline here that we're going to get to explore as time goes on. I know you both have a great deal of work ahead of you, not only in the weeks and months to come, but also later today. So I'm going to wrap things up here. I tremendously appreciate your great generosity in having me here, allowing me to see all of what's been going on, and sharing the time here with my students and the, the larger community to have a sense of what's going on. So congratulations on a world-changing discovery. It's going to be, I think, a very fun ride for all of us as we move forward. For us too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.